This week I did one of those things in life I despise doing. After a minor car accident where no one was hurt, my wife needed a different vehicle. We decided after some debate that because the car no longer was able to make a right hand turn, we should break down and buy a different vehicle. Though I still argue three lefts make a right, so maybe we could have lasted another six months, but, but we went to a car dealership. In fairness, my wife had done ample amounts of research. She knew what she wanted. She knew the price, knew the dealership, so we went. We showed up, we had that awkward conversation, at least for me, it's always awkward. Then we went and we test drove the vehicle. It was perfect, it was exactly what we wanted. We went back in, we sat down, and we began to have the conversation about price. They told us the price of the vehicle, and immediately I got frustrated. Here's the entire story. In my wife's research, she had written down the price of a number of different vehicles, and somewhere along the line, one number got exchanged for another number. And so we were looking at a car that was slightly differently, it was different price than what we had anticipated. But I assumed, not very Christian of me, that this is what the dealer had done to us. That they advertised this price, and when we showed up, it was this price. And for a moment there, I was thinking, is is there no end to your hypocrisy? What, what kind of people are you? You get us under here under false pretenses. You sit us down. You give us a cup of coffee and a cheap chocolate chip cookie. And then you, and then you spring this on us. Turns out they were actually right the entire time. It was our mistake. But as I think about that experience, I wonder, go with me on this, I wonder if Peter and James... If Andrew and John may have looked at Jesus every once in a while and wondered the same thing, what in the world did you just spring on us? After all, the disciples, Peter and Andrew, James and John, they were the ones who dropped their nets and they followed Jesus. In the Gospel of Luke, they followed Jesus, we think, because of two things. We, there's two things they know about Jesus. First, Jesus had healed Peter's mother-in-law, so they knew they knew he was capable of doing great things. But here's the other thing they knew. When Jesus called Peter and Andrew, and when he called James and John, he was calling not just fishermen, but brothers, friends, people who had commonality, people who had shared common interest. In other words, when Jesus invited them into the church, Jesus was saying, hey, this is a community for people like you. Who would not want to join a community where it's your best friends and your family members and you get to serve one who is capable of doing great things not only for you but for your family and for your friends? If that's the invitation, I would sign up for any club, any organization, family and friends with someone who's able to do wonderful things for those I care the most about. That sounds like exactly how I would like to spend my days. And then Jesus seems to change the deal just a little bit as they go on. You see, the first thing he does is Jesus meets a leper. When I say this, I always have to caution this because I've had more young people uh, question me after services when I talk about leprosy. When I mention a leper, it's, it's not a four-legged animal. It is a person with a skin disease, which does change the story pretty significantly. <laughs> In the first century, a person who had a skin disease was forced to live outside of the community. Now this sounds very harsh, but we, we understand medically why. Because if a person had some sort of disease and it passed to another and to another, it could wipe out an entire village. So for safety, for issues of safety, once a person had leprosy, he or she was forced to live outside the community. Now, if they were healed somehow, if finally the rash went away, they could return to the community after the priest had said, you're safe, you're healed, but only then. This meant that for a group of people, they lived literally on the wrong side of town. They were living away from others, family and friends. And why this was so painful 
is because do you know what happens to people who live on the margins of society? Eventually, they are forgotten. Out of sight, out of mind. You have a small group of people, very isolated, feeling alone, who are ignored and overlooked. And then it happens. Jesus goes to a man with leprosy. He takes Peter and Andrew, James and John, and before they can reach out and grab him, Jesus walks right up to the man with leprosy, grabs a hold of him, making himself unclean, making himself one of the marginalized, and then he speaks a word of healing. Immediately, the man's condition is, is restored. His skin is clean, and he's able to go back and return to the community. The disciples rejoice, but deep down in their hearts, you know there's a little bit of a question. What, what do we just sign up here for, Jesus? Because when we started this little group, this was for people like us, right? This was for our family members and for our friends. This is, this is what the community was supposed to be about, and you, and you were going to look after us. And now, now we're reaching out to this former leper, this person on the margins. I, they're excited, they're happy, but they're wondering, what did we sign up for? When does it end, Jesus? Where's, where's the line where we know these people are in and these people are out? As if to answer that question, Jesus does yet another healing. In the Gospel of Luke, the very next healing, this time it is a man who is paralyzed. In the first century, people who are paralyzed live a very, very short period of time. And more often than not, they're dependent upon the grace and the generosity of people around them, family, friends, and strangers. So in this particular story, the paralyzed man is brought outside the synagogue where he sits. He is not, by the way, allowed to come into the worshiping community. Because of his health, because of his condition, he's not welcomed into the body that worships the living God. He literally sits outside of it. And as the people walk by each and every day, he holds out his hand, hoping that they'll give him just enough to make it through the day, just enough to make it through the week. The problem with this is you know how it works. If there are, is a crowd of people walking, there's enough people, yes, your chances of making money go up. The more money, the more people, the more opportunities there are to make money. And at the same time, you know what happens when there's a big crowd of people, right? It becomes easier to ignore. It becomes easier to overlook this person. Because all you have to do now is if you see him up ahead on his mat, all you have to do is pretend to be in a conversation with your neighbor or, or to walk to the middle of the crowd so you can walk by without making eye contact completely 100% guilt-free. That's what's happening to this man over and over and over again until, until Jesus approaches him. Jesus approaches him. Next thing you know, Jesus is talking about the forgiveness of sin, giving out forgiveness to anyone and everyone. The disciples aren't even really sure what to make of this. And then when some people question whether Jesus has the authority to do this, well, he reaches out, he grabs a hold of the man, and he says, take your mat, stand up, and go home. And in that moment, the paralyzed man stands up, he takes his mat, and he goes home, fully restored to health. The crowd is amazed. The disciples are clapping. They can't believe how great this is, but that night, I wonder if they begin to think, so where does this end? This community was supposed to be for people like us, our family and friends, and now we're reaching out to the marginalized and to those who are ignored. Are they part of us as well? The seventh chapter, I believe, of the Gospel of Luke is Jesus, his final attempt to answer this question once and for all. He's just preached his most famous sermon. He has a huge crowd of people. He's going to the city of Capernaum when he is greeted. A bunch of uh, Jewish elders come out from the local synagogue and they begin to beg him to come to this centurion, to this Roman soldier's home. This Roman soldier has a servant who is very, very ill, a Hebrew servant, 
and the Roman soldier has sent them to see if Jesus will come and heal him. They say all these wonderful things about the Roman soldier. He's helped build the synagogue. He's very nice to us. Do do you know what that is akin to in the first century? Saying that a Roman soldier is a nice Roman soldier, it's like saying that the pig in your backyard is the prettiest pig you've ever seen. It's really not a compliment. It's really not. Roman soldiers in the first century are evil in the eyes of the Hebrew people. They are. They are living, breathing reminders that Caesar Augustus rules this place. It is li- they are living, breathing reminders that the Hebrew people are second-class citizens in their own homes. The soldiers would make money more often than not by going to the homes along with the tax collectors, and when they got ready to pay the taxes, if the Hebrew people were supposed to pay 10% of their earnings to Caesar Augustus, the Roman soldiers would hold out their hand and say, it's 20% this week. And there wasn't anything the Hebrew people could do about it. The Roman soldiers are the, are the enemies of God's people. And so, when people come saying, can you help this Roman soldier out? This is the time. This is the moment for Peter and James, John and Andrew, where Jesus is supposed to draw the line in the sand and say, okay, this is who's a, who belongs. People like us, family and friends, maybe a few that have been marginalized, maybe a couple people who have been left out, but no, not these people. This is where Jesus is supposed to draw the line. This is the moment where Jesus is supposed to say, this is where it ends. That is always the challenge for communities of faith, including ours as well. The greatest strength of United Lutheran Church is not our staff, though I think we have a pretty good staff. It's not our traditions, though we have a rich and and rich traditions which we should celebrate in a myriad of ways. The greatest strength of our congregation is the relationship among our members. It is your commitment to caring for one another. That is the greatest strength of this congregation. And I picked up on that. It took two weeks to figure this out. I see how you care for one another in the midst of health crisis. I see you caring for one another when people are going through different transitions in life. That is the strength of United Lutheran. And that is a very, very good thing. But it has a shadow side. The shadow side is this. It is likely that you look around the sanctuary this morning, especially at the people sitting in your section, because let's be honest, we all have sections, right? And most of the people in your section are probably friends and or family members. Again, that is a good thing. But here's the shadow side. The temptation is to begin to think that the church is the place for my friends and for my family members and for the people who are like me and me alone. And that's the challenge. Because as Jesus shows us again and again, what about the marginalized? What about those who are ignored? As we read the stories of the Gospel of Luke, who are the people you think of? Who are the people who are not here? And I'm not, I don't mean literally this Sunday morning because let's, let's face it, it's Memorial Day weekend. We all know there are people in your section who are not here today. But, but who are the people who are never here? Who are the people who are marginalized, who live on the proverbial wrong side of town? Who are the people who are overlooked or who are ignored? The people that you see at the library or walking down the street or at the post office, you see them, but but you never pay attention to them. It's, It's a question I have to ask myself as well. Who are the people we overlook? And is there a place for them in the community of God? Notice what Jesus does in the seventh chapter of Luke's gospel because it answers that question once and for all. Jesus goes. The disciples are thinking Jesus is going to draw a line in the sand. If they, do, if they draw the line, then Jesus steps over that line because he goes to the Roman soldier's house, or at least he tries to. This is the amazing part of the story. As he's walking to the Roman soldier's house to heal the servant, 
to do what the Roman soldier has asked him to do, to help out the enemy of God's people, suddenly a friend of the Roman soldier comes out and meets him. And this is what he says. He says, my, my friend doesn't want you to even come inside. Not, it's not being rude. He knows he's beneath you. He does not presume to have you come in. He's not worthy of that. Instead, it's a Roman soldier talking. Instead, he just asks you to speak a word of healing because he trusts. Even if you've never met this servant of his, if you speak a word of healing, it will be done. And Jesus is amazed. Do you know how many times in the Gospels Jesus is amazed? Friends, it's a short, short list. Jesus is amazed at the faith of one who is supposed to be the enemy of God's people, of someone that the disciples would have said, no, no, he doesn't belong. Jesus is amazed by this one's faith. The servants go back. They enter into the centurion man's house, the centurion soldier's home, and he, they see that the servant has been healed. Where does it end? Where does the love of God finally end? And the answer is nowhere. It extends to us, to our family, to our friends. It extends to those who are marginalized. It extends to those who are overlooked. And finally, it extends even to the enemies of God's people or to the people we say we don't even like them very much for whatever reason. The love of God extends to them. And as followers of Jesus Christ, that is, becomes our job as well, to reach out to the marginalized, to notice the overlooked, and to listen, to listen to those we may disagree with vehemently. Because in doing so, the love of God in Jesus Christ might not just would, might surround them, but it also might begin to amaze us. May it do just that. Amen.